welcome back to Room Hacks Res Ed Chat Podcast. This is your digital variety hour for housing and residence life professionals, uh, where we talk about issues that are of importance to you. Uh, and today we're actually going to be starting, we're going to try something new. We're going to mix things up. Um, since we started this podcast, uh, I've done it solo, but today I got a co-host, uh, our Akuhawai intern for this summer, Camille. Camille, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I know. I'm so excited we're going to get a chance to co-host together. This is going to be a good experience for both of us. I, I believe so. I truly hope so. How are you doing, <laughs> Paul? Well, I, I tell you, so like when I'm thinking about a co-hosting for people that are thinking about podcasts and like, how do we put this together? Um, you know, I, I wanted a co-host experience because I think different people bring different perspectives. And when you have a co-host kind of arrangement, it just brings more value and more uh, perspective. And, you know, like I'm going to think of some things, but you think of things differently. And that's one of the reasons why I want to do this. but. You know, it's also interesting, especially if you you haven't, we've never co-hosted something together, right? We haven't. So, um, you know, getting that groove, getting that flow, wanting it to be smooth for the for our listeners there, uh, you, for all of you, uh, so that you think we got this down. Um, that's what's most making me a little bit nervous. I don't know. What are you thinking about in terms of, because you've never even hosted a podcast, so that, this is wholly new to you. I have never hosted a podcast. I think I listen to like a whole three podcasts in general. So my podcast repertoire, there's not a whole lot going on there. But I feel like I took Rhetoric 101 at the University of Iowa. And if that didn't prepare me to co-host a podcast, I don't know what will. So I'm excited to be here today. I really hope it goes well. We've prepped, we've researched, we're ready to bring on our guest. Yeah, yeah. Throw us some love on, on some social media or in the comments, uh, just just to just to give us some encouragement to keep doing this. All right, well, let's get to our guest today. Um, we have one of my personal favorite humans uh, uh, on the show today, uh, Devon Vincent Bryan, who is the associate director of residence life at University of Pittsburgh. How are you, Devon? <laughs> well. Now my heart's all full, knowing that one of your favorite people. Um, I am well. I am good. It is a perfect 73 degrees here today uh, and sunny. And that has not been the case of late. And so I'll take it where I can get it. Um, probably going to do a little walk in nature after this. I know. I had to look at the, I had to look at my watch for the temperature outside because I don't, now that I work remotely, I don't, I don't, I feel like I don't go outside. <laughs> You have to make time for it. You have to. I think you have to intentionally make time it, for it. Right. <laughs> but it is also 73 degrees in Boston. Uh, Camille, what, what's the temperature? And where are you now? I don't even know. I'm in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And it oh, okay. is toasty here. I am in my parents' backyard. You can see we have a cemetery in our backyard. So if you want to just peep that over here with the gate, it's kind of fun and edgy but it's about 84 here it's pretty Ooh. toasty but I'm, I'm trying to trying to get some vitamin d it's that midwest summer heat I've, I've lived in that midwest summer heat it's it's pretty especially with the humidity it can be pretty gnarly yeah that's very true very true <laughs> Well, anyways, let's, you know, we actually got on here because we want to bring Devon on to talk about something that I think um, everyone loves, which is food. Um, and those of you that follow Devon on social media are treated to uh, the cooking, cooking a plate du jour for dinner, uh, you know, <laughs> which can range from, from a number of things, but uh, Devon's a pretty passionate cook and also incorporates it with students and his work in residence life, which I think is really kind of the cool part about it. Um, but Devon, where does this passion for cooking come from? Like where, you, you do it a lot. Like, no. I mean, you are really into it. This isn't just mm -hmm. a side hobby for you. This is like your life. Where, mm -hmm. where did that come from? It's uh, a good question. I would say being raised, um, by two fantastic grandparents, specifically grandmas, who only do things from scratch. Like if my grandmothers could make the cheese before making the mac and cheese, they would do that, right? Um, and seven amazing women um, who taught me 
um, really this like the, the foundation and facts of life, but also pieces of independence and growth and pride and um, community and sharing. Um, we, there was no such thing as this coming together, getting your food, finding a plate and going to a different room, right? There was always a communal table experience. And that uh, was supremely planted deeply within me. My grandmother and my mother's side was also very specific. She was very fearful that one day I'd get married to someone who couldn't cook and her baby would starve to death, right? Like that was her fear um, and it drove her, right? So she was like, no, I'm like, mm -mm. you stand right here um, as I make this from scratch, right? Because maybe gotta eat, maybe gotta eat, maybe gotta eat well. Um, yeah. So I appreciate that. Yeah, food equals community, right? Could you, talk, could you talk a little bit about how you are focusing your passions at the center of some student engagement activities? I, I creeped your profile ahead of time and it seems like you have uh, you've done some cooking activities with, with some of your residents in previous roles. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, in in literally all of my, <laughs> my all of my roles, uh, when I was an RD, um, I worked um, very carefully and very closely with our dining provider at SNHU, and um, we would do behind the tours, behind the scene tours of our dining halls, um, both so they can see the staff who was preparing the food, right, um, cultivate that, that level of respect for um, the hands that are providing. It is not just a conveyor belt of delicious food from nowhere. Um, I created an LLC around food and food sustainability and how those two things shook hands. Um, as an area coordinator at Clark University, um, I would go from hall to hall making dinner with students. Um, and then I realized that like pots and pans are really heavy. <laughs> And as much as I really enjoy our students, I will do literally anything for them. Um, packing like a Dutch oven in a, in a suitcase and then wheeling it across the green, like I could only do so many times, right? So um, I worked with our student uh, TV station and we created um, the food spot, um, which brought students uh, from all across the campus to me where I could keep the things. Um, and it had, you know, moments where we can have conversations, get to know each other, uh, deepen that connection, but also like share a meal. Uh, at Pitt, um, our dining hall staff knows me well. Um, I do a couple signature programs. Uh, one of them is my favorite is late night breakfast. It's when I show up and take command of the dining hall. And for that night, everyone works with me, right? We're all here making an experience happen. And it's always themed. Um, one of the most recent ones was um, themed around um, the rainbow, um, really looking at each of our halls have a different color. And so rainbows made sense, right? But I um, met with the chefs and said, well, if we're gonna do a rainbow theme, right? It has to be all airy, it has to be all clouds, it has to be all, right? And so we're gonna figure out how to make this cloud bread, right? And they're like, Devon, cloud bread is a novel thing for like, you know, on a Saturday. And I'm like, no, no, we gotta make cloud bread for 3,000 people. We gotta figure it out. <laughs> then we're gonna make it happen. Um, what, what is cloud bread? I don't cloud even think bread I know. Is, <laughs> Cloud bread is really like the egg whites um, whipped to like a stiff peak um, with some stabilizers in it and then baked, right? So Got it. it falls a bit, but it still looks like puffy and airy. Uh, and at the right temperature, it still looks a little white, right? So it's this really airy, um, almost like a um, uh, macaroon texture. Um, mm -hmm. you put that next to some like fresh made jam and jellies and yes, um, flew off the table, flew off the shelves. Um, scones had no chance that night. Um, and so those are the things I've, I have done uh, in, 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 in all those spaces and those programs span, right? Again, working with thousands of students for an evening or just a floor with an RA or um, folks kind of tuning in uh, by the YouTubes to, to, to learn, grow, and, and, and see their, their head of hall or their RD in a different way. Um, yeah. How did some of those ideas originate? So they center around food, but did you see a need with the student body? You're like, hey, these kids get food from a, from a residence hall, like a dining center. Did you, were you trying to make it more of a learning activity? Was this more about incorporating your passions? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I would just throw away the or. <laughs> right uh, and just and ampersand right right um 
It was about doing all of that. One, I try to connect my passions to everything that I do. Um, working in student affairs, working in residence life, it is a demanding um, capacity, right? And so if there's nothing to fill that bucket or that belly, <laughs> uh, then, you know, it, where, does, where does that fuel come from? And so if you can connect those things, right, it becomes a, more of a self, self-sufficient engine. So passion had to be in there. Um, and then students, you know, have, they see TV, right? I have, I've worked mostly with first year students. And so they have visions of like the RA who's trying to document them and the RD who's just a conduct officer. Um, and so how do I help them see the humanity, the person, the care um, but behind the title, right? And so we all got to eat. <laughs> so there's there's a there's a door. Um, I think about how we have conversations in ways that are disarming, right? So over some of these dishes, we've talked about some really heavy topics: identity, discrimination, race. Um, recently, here at Pitt, we talked about over over dinner talked about um, how COVID intersects with um, medical access, um, cross paths with uh, racial injustice, right? Um, the, didn't solve it in that in that conversation, but but boy was that robust, right? The boy did that take our, our group to the next level to do that while while sharing a meal, kind of normalized and and disarmed that the tension in that space, right? And then I do believe that we are here to be educators and to provide skills and tools and and do it in a way that doesn't always need to sit in the classroom. Right, we can do that co-curricular, um, and how do we crystallize that knowledge? You get folks kind of using it, touching it, understanding it. Right, and so when we make dough, right, I'm rarely like one parts flour and two parts. Right, it's a feel thing. Right, you're going for a little spring. Right, <laughs> right, and so let's get in there and and get those ratios going of water and flour and salt. Right, until it gets to that texture that that feels right to the touch. Right. Um, so that's really the motivation is to try to connect all those dots so that like, yes, the students are having a fantastic experience, but frankly, so am I, because um, I'm here too. Um, and then memories come from that, right? We associate um, powerful moments with a dish we had or um, the table it was served at or the people who were around that space, right? And so that knowledge, uh, I think, goes further, further than the cognitive, like right to the heart right, when there's a warm element to that, and that could be some apple pie. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're making me think of, so, I mean, you, you know, I've been around the residence life block uh, <laughs> myself uh, here or there, um, and I think back to the time that I was supervising RAs, um, and there were some times that, like, cooking and or food-related programs uh, we're clearly a phone it in kind of activity, right? Oh, we're gonna make this and talk about culture. And I'm like, are you really gonna talk about like in a deep, like community building kind of way? Or is this, we want you to pay for the food that we already know we wanna make. And we'll add the discussion on as a means of making sure our budget gets approved for it, right? Um, <clears throat> how do you, I think from what you described with me, there's a lot of intentionality in the way that you do these food things. Um, what is that intentionality? Like what are those goals and outcomes that, that you bake in and that I think you just do probably as part of just your own personal being? Like you might not even think about it, um, but how can others maybe even think about what are the intentionality we can build into these kinds of like cooking-based, food-based, community eating, yeah. Uh, types of experiences for students. Yeah. So I think one is seen as a true investment um, of time and energy and care. Uh, I think back to when we did late night breakfast island style. And I pitched this idea uh, or the theme, right? Uh, how we do it at Pitt is we give five or six themes to the community and the community chooses a top two. One happens in the fall, one happens in the spring. And so island theme came up. Um, and I brought to our student staff, like, okay, here's a theme that folks are interested in. Um, where do you see this going, right? And you could probably guess, right? There was some performative concerning like, oh, you know, coconut thing and maybe some tiki torch, like, okay, right? Could we enact that? Absolutely. 
where's the learning in that? Not sure I can find it, right? And so we talked about, okay, well, when we're talking about islands, what's coming to mind for folks? Let's just pull up a chart. Let's pull up a, 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 a map, right? And really zoned in on where in the world are we thinking about when we're thinking about this theme? As we found a section of the world, right? We zoned in the Polynesian islands, right? Well, if we're gonna do that, do the things that we're talking about match anything that we see uh, in any, you know, I'll say with a basic search of, of this culture, of this place, of these people? The answer was easily no, right? And so, what, well, how do we, how do we bring respect and reverence into that conversation? Yeah. How do we bring authenticity into that that exchange, right? Uh, and so, folks were like, "Well, I don't know. I'm not Polynesian. <laughs> right? That's fair. Fair, yeah. Are there members of our community that are? We have a senior associate director of um, athletics who uh, is of Polynesian descent. We have members of our teams and clubs and organizations, right? Who so how do we? bring those folks to the table so that in, in our areas of deficit, where we may not have the most knowledge, how do we um, bring folks who have that experience, that lived experience, or that academic experience to inform our process, right? Uh, and so we looked at the food and sourcing of food. It was one of, one of the very first times that I had food flown in, <laughs> right, to the university because yeah, I wanted to flown in for one I of sure them. did. I sure did. I sure did. Yeah. And it was yeah. freeze dry. This, and is, why, this is why you're one of my favorite humans. Right <laughs> and I'm going to have the that food. That feels it for me. <laughs> Just so that little know. bit of extra <laughs> is why you're one of my favorite humans. Well, you're going to love this last part. Now that you have the food flown in, we flew in Polynesian dancers from Florida. They did. They have a home base there. Um, and they took over our first floor. They decorated. They taught uh, our students how to husk um, uh, uh, a coconut properly using um, uh, traditional tools. They taught them how to do some of the dances of culture. They walked through history, through dance. They brought the students in and taught them some of those moves, some better than others, right? But they, they picked it up, right? Um, they were our taste testers, right? So we brought our culinary team and said, here's the menu. Here are the ingredients that we have. Here's what we need to fly in. Right. And then for this evening, our judging panel of the district dishes we're creating, I'm going to have folks from the islands. We're going to say um, spot on here. This needs a little more of this. Right. We would make this this way. Right. Um, and that 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 night was not only one of the, one of the best themes that we, we had over the past few years. I saw so many parts of our community come together learning, growing, having conversations, digging deeper, asking questions, um, trying new things. Because um, some dishes they don't know, right? Yeah. This is based on cassava. I don't know what a cassava is. And so putting that information in space, right? So they can read along or feel comfortable asking those questions, right? So when I say intention, I mean, yeah, anyone can pick up their credit card and dial it in and order a pizza, right? And that's fine. So does we need that. Um, but if you're going to bring food in, right, it takes an investment of your time and your education and your, and your effort, maybe also some money, <laughs> right? Um, because you want to provide reverence and respect. Um, when we're talking about the intersection of culture and food. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I was always, so when I did programming more as my day job, um, I always had a preference for, I'd rather invest money more money in something big and more impactful than try to spread it out into a lot of little things that aren't as impactful, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, that's why I think I, I appreciate your approach there because that's, I think, how I always viewed uh, programming educational efforts and things like that, that, you know, if we invest the time and do it well, that bigger impact actually is, is much more felt uh, and students are more engaged, right? Then you're not using food as a bribe, you're using food as a main central part of the educational component, um, which is, I think, a much smarter way to do it and a much probably fis more fiscally responsible way to do it, right? Yeah, we can't do late night breakfast island style on every floor, but um, boy, did I see a lot of our RAs and yeah. their floors that night. Yeah. yeah. I'm just completely in awe at how strategic 
the the e event making is because not only are you are you throwing really fun events and getting students engaged but you're also teaching them really like critical transferable skills as well like you know what is the true meaning behind this event and this activity so it really goes with like that residence education model like teaching teaching students skills which i think is so exciting so you mentioned I watched a few episodes of the food spot and in your first episode you uh, um, mentioned that curry is in your blood being Jamaican has food always been an important part of your cultural heritage and then could you also talk about maybe getting students to engage in that part of their own cultural identity yeah um yeah like I shared earlier I I learned at the, the hip of, of my grandma <laughs> in the kitchen. Um, and so it, it, is, it is in my bones. I, I remember, I can tell you in graphic detail what our kitchen looked like. I could barely remember what my bedroom's color was. We spent way more time around that stove than, you know, like in my, in, in, like playing games in my room. Um, and, and, and why it's important is because it's this, it's this, powerful medium that extends past through time, right? Um, it is, we don't write things down. I should probably share that. My grandmother has never measured a thing in her whole life. And she has never taught me any dish by telling me how many grams, how many cups. Um, it is all by touch, feel, take, right? It's all of these sensory input pieces that makes that work. And so when you're not writing something down per se, you're being told a story or being given the context or being asked to taste and then respond, it, it, it lands differently, it, it, it resonates differently. And, and then you have to transmit that to like the next generation. My brother is 13 years old. Wow, um, what a gap. Um, but when I'm home with him, or I do the same thing, I bring him in. Um, he, is, he, is, he is not a millennial, he's definitely a Gen Z, right? Um, and so the interest in the food, <laughs> not so much, but he does appreciate that I make him a part of that process, right? Um, he also likes to show off with his friends because like, look what I can make now because like my brother taught me. Um, but it's this piece of, of, of transmission of history, of our family, of our stories, the very specific ways that we put our spice blend together which is different than the way my father's side might than the family we share next door, right? Um, and, and you feel like you're holding something precious and something important. And it's your responsibility to replicate that re with reverence, but also to pass that on, right? And so in, in some ways, I, I, in many ways, in all the ways, I do look at, at that being in my blood as any of the other pieces genetically or historically that my family has passed on. Does that make sense? It totally does. It totally does. And um, I'm, I'm envious of that because that's not the food relationship I had with my family. Um, my mom did not like to cook. Uh, she was not really taught to cook when, when she was growing up. Um, you know, it's, she would always, my parents would always, it was true of my father too. And, and they would tell me the story that um, they, they didn't really try some other foods or thought foods weren't good based off of the way that they had them when they were growing up. So uh, my mom's like, never thought she liked Brussels sprouts because they used canned Brussels sprouts. So she thought all, all Brussels sprouts taste like canned Brussels sprouts or pineapple, um, canned pineapple. So she thought pineapple tastes like this. And then she went to Hawaii, I think it was in the sixties mm. and had a real one and was like, oh, this is what it's supposed to taste like. Mm -hmm. I get it now. So like food for that, you know, that, that sense that you were describing was not my experience with food and, and community and family growing up. It was still a coming together, but it was just a very different experience than the one you described. So I always, mm -hmm. when I hear people have those experiences, I'm always a little bit jealous um, mm -hmm. because it sounds like there's just so much meaning that can be taken from that. And obviously it, it, it's part of who you are, right? Like so deeply. Uh, in a way that it wasn't for me, so. And, and, I, and I take a lot of privilege, there's this privilege in that, right? And as I thought about the second half of Camille's question around, um, how do I go about making those connections? I, for me, it's also going back, you know, a generation when we have the opportunity to do that, right? My mother also cooks well and makes delicious food. I have not said her name yet. <laughs> 
because she for her it was a it was a transactional process right like yeah. we need dinner I shall make it then we shall move forward right my grandmother sat with things and you know grew, right so I, I had to think about okay I, I can see the mechanics um for my mother but if I want the roots, right? I want the genealogy. I want the the core. That's grandma land, right? Um, and if I can go further back, right? And so where the opportunity is in multi-generational households or uh, where family might be spread out, I think it's when we capitalizing on the opportunity when we can to learn from from folks and and, and continue that that um, bridge building that isn't wholly forward thinking, but also looks back sometimes right also brussels sprouts is the is the that is the go-to food where folks just lose their way right like we're talking we need high temp we need hard sear right yeah. uh, maybe some balsamic yeah to it off, maybe some feta and uh right i i've had that same conversation with my mother about about brussels sprouts oh yeah and and then when the like the little leaves kind of like crisp up almost like, they're, like little chips like that's the best part but yeah, that's that part. I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a, I'm going to get the, I'll, I'll research this after this and put it in the show notes, but there's an Instagram account. I think it's like, it's called like Nona's Making Pasta, which is basically like little old Italian grandmothers. And it's just photos and videos of them and how they make pasta and how, you know, they've done it. They were taught through their whole family. It's one of the cutest Instagram accounts. Like I, I hesitate to call them cute, but I mean, it's just like, oh, it's so woman who's making pasta like they have for hundreds of years and there's clearly so much love in it. Um, it's one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite Instagram accounts to follow. Um, what's, what's your favorite dish to make? What's one of your favorite dishes to make? Oh my hand. Um, yeah, we can accept a couple. <laughs> well, I, my go-to, my, 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 you're my friend and you're coming over for dinner. So we're probably going to have short ribs. I do a, um, a cola bread short rib. Um, maybe it's a roasted um, uh, garlic uh, and chive um, creamy mashed potato. We're going to reduce that stock, make a nice uh, jus, there'll be some gravy there. And I want, I may want to set that off with some cranberries. Um, and just to say that there's a vegetable present, uh, we might candy some carrots um, or, like I just said, heavily roast um, some Brussels sprouts on the side, right? That is that is that is a dish um, that for me just kind of screams comfort um, and warmth and 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 bones sticking good. And it also is like a set it and forget it, like braising. <laughs> keep the liquid right, keep the high heat up, and let it do. Let the meat relax, right? So um, I like you, you know my phrase and around like keeping things smart and simple and shareable. And so I'm not here to use cooking as a laborious experience. Um, it needs to feel right and still facilitate gathering, right? So if you're just focused on like the perfect temperature not to get to like a sugar crack stage, like that's not for me, right? Um, so that's that is definitely one of my one of the meals I make at least a couple of times a year and particularly uh, in cooler months and when friends are, are visiting. Does that mean risotto's out? Because risotto is a very finicky, you got to get that timing exactly. Yeah, right. risotto's not out, um, but your boy doesn't, you know, Gordon Ramsay many years ago planted a seed of fear um, that I just, I respect, you know. Um, I, I'll make it a couple times a year, but it's not my go-to because I just, I hear his voice in my head and I'm just like, oh no, chef. <laughs> Sorry, chef. <laughs> So speaking about favorite recipes, we're moving on to other favorites here. So in the food spot, you should use a lot of like correct cooking terminology. Is there a favorite term, cooking term that you have um, that you could enlighten Paul and I with here today? <laughs> there is, um, <laughs> it's, it's mise en place. Um, I, if, if I were a person to get a tattoo, is my mother gonna see this? Uh, it would be that. Um, it, it just means, it, it's just so applicable, you know, um, everything in its place, so that's loose translation. And it is, it is something I've taught and shared with everyone who has ever shared kitchen space with me. My 13 year old brother, my 19 year old residents, my 22 year old hall directors, right? Um, my 40 some odd year old peers, like 
we got to get this together. This not this this needs not be rushed. This can't be. This shouldn't be chaotic. That translates into the food. You can taste that, right? But if we take the time and put things together and put them in an order that makes sense, we can move effortlessly and smoothly and, and mindfully through that dish. And that applies to just like, you know, life, right? How do we put things together to set ourselves up for success? How do we think ahead and plan proactively? Um, that, that, that pivots into our programming model, right? When I talk about the events planning process, right? I may or may not drop that word in there as a sort of anchor point for our RAs. Um, so that's definitely a go-to word. Um, I have a lot of respect for that. I, I, I think it helps us think about um, a thoughtful approach. Uh, it, it, it is, I think it, it harkens to respect for the ingredients and, and the people and, and the place. Um, so mise en place, my word, forever. Tattooed across my arm. <laughs> that is beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, that's a, I love that word. Um, well, fi fi final question for you as we kind of wrap up here. Um, folks that want to use food-centered educational activities in the halls, um, do things, you know, some of the examples that you gave. Uh, any recommendations or things they should keep in mind that from your experience, um, this is what leads to a more successful uh, event or experience or interaction for students? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you have a few. One is your own uh, comfort and sensibility uh, yeah. with food um, to not overcomplicate it, um, to, to maybe even start small, right? Like, yes, we could have dynamic conversation about regionality. Uh, if we're bringing in a, a, a cuisine from, um, you know, the southern region of, of India, right? That may be not be your wheelhouse, and that may not that may be extending to a space where um, the ability to have that be an organic conversation might be challenged. Um, you can have that with a sandwich, right? I've had so many conversations about like mortadella <laughs> and like hanging meats and curing things and salt and, and how that plays a role in, in flavor development, right? And so I have done things that just brought in different types of cold cuts that we, you know, we think about like tuna and bologna and ham and turkey, but there's so much more, <laughs> right? And that's with the help of like, you know, the, the staff at the store, right? Getting the name, a little bit of the history, right? A little bit of Googling, right? Being able to effectively name and label those pieces, where they come from, what's in them, um, have folks try them, you know, even at different temperatures and respond. What are you, you know, mindful eating? What are you tasting? What are you feeling? What are you smelling, right? Um, so it's, it's about not necessarily going for the gold. It's, it's, work within the parameters of the space and the, the, the resources you have, but think about how do you make that an, ex, uh, an opportunity for exchange, for discovery, for development, for, uh, that's where I would start, right? Uh, and then allow your resources to, to fill in the blanks in terms of how that happens. Because I'll tell you what, the cold cuts weren't expensive, <laughs> but the experience um, of that and having students you know, apply that to mindful eating, apply that to regionality, you know, apply that to where in place does this food come from and why is it produced the way that it is? Um, historically speaking, that was priceless, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much, Devon. I really appreciate you coming on the, the podcast today to kind of share these experiences. Obviously, always a fun time to, to talk with you and uh, chat with you and Kiki and uh, have a good laugh. So thank you uh, for joining us today. And uh, any final thoughts to leave people with? Any, any well wishes? Final thoughts and well wishes well to all my peers and colleagues out there in Res Life land. Um, I know the summer hasn't necessarily been wholly restful. We have a fall to plan for. Um, you can do it. We are hopefully at the tail end of this you know, time and space in this pandemic. And um, our students are gonna be looking to us to, to connect to re-engage, to reimagine, um, do that in space, do that with your students, be a part of the conversation, do it around food um, and, and have fun with it. That, that is gonna be the core uh, of our fall charge and really the year ahead as we rebuild um, what it means to kind of live in our residential spaces. I yeah. wish you well. Couldn't have said it better myself.
And I wish the, the same for you this fall, my friend. I know it's been a, a weird year, but I know you've also kind of navigated it with some grace. So uh, kudos to you. Uh, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'm Paul and this is Camille. And we're happy oh. to co-host this episode today. So we'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.